glad you're here today. Let's all stand up for this first song. Let, let's uh, have a word of prayer. Father, we thank you for this day, Lord, and thank you for gathering us together here. Lord, in, with one voice to worship you and to hear from you. Just be with us. Bless our time together. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. It never gives up, it never runs out on me. Your love never fails, it never gives up, it never runs out on me. Your love never fails, it never gives up, it never runs out on me. Your love and all. gives up it never runs out on me your love never fails it never gives up it never runs out on me your love never fails it never gives up it never runs out on me your love in death in life I'm confident and covered by the power of your great love. My debt is paid. There's nothing that can separate my heart from your great love. Your love never fails. It never gives up. It never runs out on me. It never fails, it never gives up, it never runs out on me. Your love never fails, it never gives up, it never runs out on me. Your love. In death, in life, I'm confident and covered by the power of your great fails it never gives up it never runs out on me your love never fails it never gives up it never runs out on me your love never fails it never gives up it never runs out on me your love never ending your love is never ending Failing, it's your love, your love, your love. Your love is never ending. Your love is never failing. It's your love, your love, your love. Your love never fails. It never gives up. It never runs out on me. Your love never fails, it never gives up, it never 
runs out on me. Your love never fails, it never gives up, it never runs out on me. Your love, your love. can be seated if you like. Is this the end? I see the signs unfold. I can feel it's near Will I be bold Or will my heart grow cold It's the thing I fear Jesus, you're coming soon It's true With eyes like flames of fire Look up, your redemption draws nearer To you, to you I hear the cries I see the people sigh can't find relief. They search for peace and they keep on trying. It's beyond their reach. Jesus, you're coming soon. It's true. With eyes like flames of fire Look up, your redemption draws near To you To you Come to me for truth but they keep on lying they can't seem to choose Jesus you're coming soon it's true with eyes like flames of fire Look up, your redemption draws near to you, to me. Jesus, you're coming soon, it's true. With eyes like flames of fire. Look up, be ready for his soon return for you, for me. Will I be bold or will my heart grow cold?
finding myself at a loss for words and the funny thing is it's okay the last thing I need is to be heard but to hear what you would say Finding myself in the midst of you, beyond the music, beyond the noise. All that I need is to be with you and in the quiet. Cause you're in this place Please let me stay and rest In your holiness Word of God speak I'm finding myself to be heard but to hear what you would say
tears falls on me like raindrops Your mercy like the dew of the Lord Your love is like the warmth of sunshine On eagles' wings you make me so On eagles' wings will I soar Your spirit's like a flowing river Your word washes over me Your grace, it fills me up completely Lifts me up and sets me free Lifts me up and I am free You're my hope You're my peace You have saved me And I will praise you You're my joy you're my everything, Jesus, who is like you. You took my place and saved my soul. You changed my heart and made me whole. Your grace falls on me like rain. Your mercy like the morning dew Your love is like the warmth of sunshine Through it all you make me new Through it all I am new Your joy. You're my everything, Jesus, who is like you. You're my hope. You're my hope. You're my peace. You have saved me, and I will praise you. You're my joy. You're my everything, Jesus, who is like you. You took my place and saved my soul. You changed my heart and made me whole. I am yours forevermore. Thank you, Jesus, for who you are. Thank you that you claimed us by your blood. You make us new. You are our hope, our joy, our peace. Thank you, Jesus, that we have you to hope in in this dark world. Thank you ahead of time for your word, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray.
Amen. Morning. Our ushers would come forward. Let's pray. Father God, I thank you again that we're just here this morning, Lord. I just lift up those who can't be here for various reasons, Father. And Lord, I just pray that you just open all of our hearts this morning just to receive your word that Mike has to share. And Father, I just pray too, Lord, that um, you just continue to bless our church family in the Philippines. Lord, they asked for prayer again this week. Just, to, just continued in their... Um, they just have a heart to serve, Lord, and just to reach the lost, Father. And that's what their prayers are, that we just keep them in our prayers, Father. And, Lord, I just pray, too, Father, as we just give our tithes and offerings, Lord, that you just receive them and multiply them. And, Lord, I just uh, thank you for just taking care of us, this little church community. We just pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So just a couple things. We still have a few of those. We've got several of these back, so thank you all very much, these little bottles that we're filling up with the change. But it's uh, through February 19th is the, well, of course, you can always donate, but the baby bottle campaign is through the 19th. So there's still some empty ones back there. So time to see what's in your pockets and empty them out, put them back there. But we still have another week. So grab these, take them home, fill them up. And again, anything fits in there, even dollar. You can take the lids off. Fill them up with whatever, gold dust, doesn't matter. All is good. So again, that's through February 19th. And then, uh, let's see, we've got, um, the men's group is the first and the third Saturdays, but we're going to cancel this upcoming Saturday. So we're just going to be gone that uh, Saturday, so let's just uh, pick it up the first uh, next month, March. And then uh, we have our church potluck coming up on March 5th, so just that's going to be a spaghetti and pasta theme, so be thinking about that yes i know it's like exciting spaghetti yes. yes garlic bread and jen's already committed to bringing the garlic bread lots of it <laughs> she's like don't sign me up so anyways um does anybody have anything they'd like to share with our church family this morning just good but anyway yes yes Yes, absolutely. So that is um, the one thing that we yes, need to do soon is we see so all the down branches and that. So we just got to find a, you know, a, maybe a Saturday that works for anybody who can come. We can literally probably clean it all up. We'll bring a chipper and stuff down, cut up the big stuff, chip everything, just rake, pull some weeds and just general cleanup. So there's a lot of branch to pick up, but literally within a couple hours, we can have it all cleaned up. So we'll find once I, we get back into town, we'll plan a Saturday or even a Friday afternoon or something where we can get together and just go out there and just get after and get it all cleaned up. So what, what day for what day is that? The 25th. So. So it's here. What time is it's here at church? At the, so Tyler's memorial service is going to be here at the church on the 25th at 11 o'clock. So again, please, if you can be here for that, that would be wonderful. So again, uh, the 25th at 11 o'clock for Tyler. So, well, with that, um, that's all I have to share. So good to see everybody here this morning. So our children are dismissed. All right, let's pray. Father, we thank you um, again for your word. This morning, Lord, as, as you teach us and instruct us in your word and, and of things to come, um, Lord, just um, may these things penetrate our hearts. In Jesus' name, amen. So still in the Gospel of Matthew and have been for quite some time now. We're in uh, Matthew 24 as we make our way through the Bible. And uh, remember uh, from the previous studies, Jesus is on the Mount of Olives overlooking the Temple Mount. And he's having a private conversation with uh, four of them, Peter, James, John, and Andrew. And <clears throat> so far we've studied the end of the age, parts one through five in this section of Matthew, Matthew 24. So five, five parts so far in Matthew 24. And uh, where Jesus gave us the signs of his coming again in the end of the age, which will increase in frequency and intensity as they reach their climax in the tribulation period. Last week's message was the sign of the fig tree, Israel being back in their land again, all of these signs being fulfilled in the generation that sees them, and yet the day and the hour are unknown. Today's message is a world gone mad. 
as we study verses 37 through 44. So let's jump in, verse 37. <clears throat> but as the days of Noah were, so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. For as in the days before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, until the day that Noah entered the ark, and did not know until the flood came and took them all away. So also will the coming of the Son of Man be. Then two men will be in the field, one will be taken, the other left. Two women will be grinding at the mill, one will be taken and the other left. Watch therefore, for you do not know what hour your Lord is coming. But know this, that if the master of the house had known what hour the thief would come, he would have watched and not allowed his house to be broken into. Therefore, you also be ready, for the Son of Man is coming at an hour you do not expect. So the days of Noah is another sign of the end of the age and the second coming of Jesus Christ. And the days of Noah were characterized as a world gone completely mad. <laughs> I mean, that's the best way I could describe it. So Jesus is saying, pay, it, pay attention to the days of Noah, and this will be a sign of his coming again. So let's look at that. First, the days of Noah were, were unrestrained wickedness. Unrestrained wickedness, verse 37. But as the days of Noah were so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. So Jesus says that his coming again will be as the days of Noah were. So what were those days like? Now remember, the days of Noah led to God pouring out judgment on the entire earth in the form of a global flood. A flood that encapsulated the whole world, and destroyed all people, save eight, except eight. In a very literal way, God was washing, he was cleansing the earth from its evil state at that point in time. Now to find out how bad things really were, we need to go back to Genesis. Back to Genesis 6, verse 5. And then the, law, the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And the Lord was sorry that he had made man on the earth and he was grieved in his heart. I'm reading that slowly because just so it sinks in a little bit. Verse 7. So the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast, creeping thing and birds of the air, for I am sorry that I have made them. Now, only eight people got on Noah's ark. That's it. And that's how far this wickedness had run its course. No one was seeking after God anymore. The entire population of the earth at that time, which very easily could have been in the millions, or even some estimate in the billions, it was completely contaminated by wickedness. It blows the mind. But folks, we're headed that way again in our day and age. We are on, well, I was going to say the right track. We're on the wrong track. <laughs> they say history repeats itself, and that's what's happening. The wickedness of mankind is increasing exponentially. Every day on the news, there seems to be a new horrific news story that you just step back and go, man, I can't believe it. And crimes are taking place that would have completely shocked people 50 years ago. They're so bad. And right now, it seems to be a world gone mad. And if it's like that now, can you imagine what it's going to be like in the tribulation period? In that last seven years before Jesus returns again? 
I mean, this whole transgender thing that's going on right now, it just blows your mind. And the sacredness of marriage is being spit on in our day and age. The word of God is being rejected. And because of that, people are just running wild. In fact, that's what the Bible says. Proverbs 29, 18 says, Where there is no revelation, the people cast off restraint. But happy is he who keeps the law. I like the way the New Living Translation words this. When people do not accept divine guidance, they run wild. But whoever obeys the law is joyful. And this is what we're seeing right now in this world. Unrestrained evil, unrestrained wickedness. And think about this again. During the flood of Noah, every single person on earth died except for eight. This was a wicked, contaminated time. And I believe the demonic activity was at an all-time high as I believe it's becoming today. We don't realize it, folks, but what we're seeing is demonic activity. Remember this passage, we already looked at it, talking about the tribulation period. Chapter 16 of Revelation, verse 13. It says, and I saw three unclean spirits like frogs coming out of the mouth of the dragon, that's Satan, out of the mouth of the beast, that's the Antichrist, and out of the mouth of the false prophet, that's the false prophet. Verse 14, for they are the spirits, or they are spirits of what? Demons performing signs which go out to the kings of the earth and of the whole world to gather them to the battle of that great day of God Almighty. Who is gathering the kings of the earth to the battle of Armageddon? Demons. Demons to fight each other. And when they see Jesus returning, to unite and turn against Jesus to prevent his coming. This is all motivated by demons. Um, verse 15, behold, I am coming as a thief. Blessed is he who watches and keeps his garment, lest he walk naked and they see his shame. And they gathered them together to the place called, in Hebrew, Armageddon. So notice the demon activity, and it's the demon activity that causes the kings of the earth to gather for this last battle before Jesus returns. Paul the Apostle said, we're not wrestling with flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, and against spiritual hosts of wickedness in heavenly places. Our battles are spiritual against unseen entities. And that's why it's so important to be in the Word of God and to be in fellowship with each other and to have on the complete armor of God, the breastplate of righteousness, the helmet of salvation, etc. And as we move closer and closer to His return, and I believe we're getting close, we're going to see more and more blatant and I mean blatant, sat satanic activity. For example, I don't know if you caught this in the news, there's a new golden idol to abortion that now stands on top of the New York City courthouse as a reminder of the fight that abortion activists defend in the mass slaughter of babies in the womb. And it's called the Now Statue. And it also hints at the satanic, a naked golden woman with braids fashioned into horns coming out of her head as she emerges from a pink lotus. This statue is meant to pay homage to Ruth Bader Ginsburg, who was an abortion activist. And so this is dedicated to her, and that's why it's on the courthouse in New York City. They're going to keep it there until June, and then they're going to move it to Texas, to a courthouse in Texas, to do their work down there. But how ironic, think about this, a satanic idol to celebrate abortion. 
I mean, how ironic and how fitting. And this world is just oblivious to it. Oh, isn't that lovely? Oh, another statue. Oh, isn't that nice, you know? But if that doesn't make you cringe, what about this? Boston's Satan Con 2023, using the supernatural, an event scheduled to take place in downtown Boston that's being touted by the Satanic Temple as the largest Satanic gathering in history. Satan Con 2023, which is scheduled April 28th through 30th in Boston, that's, you know, in a couple of months, marks the Satanic Temple's 10th anniversary, according to its website. The theme of the gathering is Hexenach in Boston, translated from German for Witches' Night, which marks the ancient pagan holiday of May Eve. SatanCon 2023, which will include discussion panels, entertainment, satanic rituals, a satanic wedding chapel, and a satanic marketplace, was dedicated to Democratic Boston Mayor Michelle Wu after the temple was not allowed to deliver an invocation at Boston City Hall. The Satanic Temple has uh, filed lawsuits on religious freedom grounds in states that limit abortion, claiming that abortion bans, uh, that abortion bans violate the rights uh, of an involuntary pregnant woman to engage in a Satanic abortion ritual. I mean, wow, folks, it's a world gone mad. And then in Idaho, our next door neighbor, members of a satanic of, of a Satanist group in Idaho plan to oppose a proposed Idaho bill that would prohibit sex change, surgery, and drugs for minors by holding a gender affirmation ritual on the grounds of the state capitol. The Boise group that calls itself Satanic Idaho, is pushing back against the proposed legislation by staging a hail-yourself gender affirmation ritual on February 13th, that's tomorrow, to remind Idahoans that not everyone uses religion to condemn but to accept, according to an advertisement on social media. The specifics of the ritual remain unclear, but according to the Satanic Temple website, gender affirmation rituals carried out with a Satanic minister, quote, serve as both celebration of the self and a declaration to the self. It's like an out-of-body experience. And others of one's true identi identity and our purpose to dispel any shame or stigma surrounding one's gender identity due to, watch this, religious discrimination or cultural ignorance. So if you have a problem with gender, you know, uh, transgender and all of that, well, it's because of religious discrimination or cultural ignorance. My oh my, folks, it is a world that's going mad, and it's getting more and more blatant by the day. And this is only scratching the surface. The second major thing that was present in the days of Noah, besides unrestrained wickedness, is unrestrained pleasure, really unrest unrestrained perversion. So you could put pleasure down, but put in parentheses, perversion. Verse 38, for as in the days of Noah, as in the days before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage until the day that Noah entered the ark and did not know until the flood came and took them all away, so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. And what's, what seems to be uh, what Jesus is saying here is that the people during the days just before the flood were carrying out business as usual, unrestrained wickedness, and their business as usual uh, with no thoughts of God or the coming judgment. They were being warned, but yet they were eating and drinking and marrying and giving in marriage. And uh, the fact that Jesus said that Marrying and giving in marriage is interesting because if we go back to Genesis just before the flood, it says this in verse 1 of chapter 6. Now it came to pass when men began to multiply on the face of the earth and daughters were born to them that the sons of God saw the daughters of men that they were beautiful 
and they took wives for themselves of all whom they chose. Now look, you can go back to our study on Genesis chapter 6, verses 1 to 8, to get background for all of this, and I would encourage you to do that. But whatever you believe about this, the writer of Genesis, who is Moses, by the way, the writer of Genesis, Moses, is telling us that something was not right that led to the flood. And I personally believe that the sons of God were rebellious angels who either took on human form or possessed human bodies and had sex with the daughters of men. There's an intentional contrast going on in the Hebrew language there between sons of God and daughters of men. And I believe that this was an unrestrained sexual perversion of mankind that worked its way through the entire human race. In fact, both Peter and Jude connect this event with Sodom and Gomorrah. Both Peter and Jude connect the flood event with what was going on in Sodom and Gomorrah, that is, sexual perversion. In fact, the people of Sodom wanted to have sex with the angels that were sent to rescue Lot. They were that bold, they were that blatant about it. As it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be at the coming of the Son of Man. Today, we can see how quickly sexual perversion has taken root in our society and around the world. And now even gender confusion, which we already mentioned, which makes sense when you think about it, because what was God's original t intent when he made mankind? To make them, what? Male and female. Right. So the whole gender thing today is a way to that Satan is trying to confuse people. And you know what? He's succeeding. He's succeeding. Now, when the flood came, it wiped out all of humanity except for eight people. What would have caused such judgment that all of mankind could not have been saved? Wow. Well, the same type of thing is going to happen in the tribulation period. In Revelation 13, we looked at this, I think, last week or two weeks ago. It says, he causes all, that is the Antichrist and the false prophet, causes all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and slave, to receive a mark on their hand, or on their right hand, or on their foreheads, and that no one may buy or sell except one who has the mark, or the name of the beast, or the number of his name. And then just in the next chapter, chapter 14, verse 9, it says, then a third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If anyone worships the beast and his image and receives his mark on his forehead or on his hand, he himself shall also drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out full strength into the cup of his indignation. But what I want you to see here is the connection with... Uh, if anyone worships the beast and his image, the connection of that with taking the mark of the beast. There is a connection, folks. It's connected. And it goes on in that passage. He shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment ascends forever and ever, and they have no rest there night, who worship the beast and his image and whoever receives the mark of his name. So you see the connection again. And then over in Revelation 20, to get the contrast to that, verse 4, And I saw thrones, and they sat on them, and judgment was committed to them. And then I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for their witness to Jesus and for the word of God, who had not worshipped the beast or his image, and had not received his mark on their foreheads or on their hands. Notice the connection again. And they lived and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. So receiving this mark is going to make a person unredeemable. Which is, I believe, what happened right before the flood. 
Now, as I've been saying all along, the Antichrist and the false prophet are not going to trick people into getting the mark. It's not going to be a trick so that you get the mark without you knowing it. it people are going to know it. They're going to know exactly what they're doing. It is going to be a pledge of allegiance to the Antichrist. It will be an identification with the Antichrist. In other words, by getting the mark, you're going to be identifying yourself with that leader. And the mark is going to have some kind of connection to the beast, to the image of the beast that's set up in the temple. So there's going to be a connection there. So if you take the mark, you are taking the image of the beast. Therefore, you're no longer in the image of God. You're in the image of Satan. And it will be unredeemable. It will be uh, blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. And today, as, as we look at the deteriorating moral values in our own nation and around the world, the divorce rate, Pornography, sexual immorality, polygamy, homosexuality, adultery, fornication, bestiality, uh, bestiality, transgender, and the list goes on and on and on. I mean, has the world gone mad? There's no sense for what God requires anymore. No sense of pleasing God, just pleasing self. Paul uh, talks about this at the beginning of Romans, in Romans chapter 1. And he says in verse 24, Therefore, God also gave them up to uncleanness in the lusts of their hearts, to dishonor their bodies among themselves, who exchanged the truth of God for the lie, and worshipped and served the creature rather than the creator, who is blessed forever. Amen. For this reason, God gave them up to vile passions. For even their women exchange the natural use for what is against nature. Likewise, also the men, leaving the natural use of the woman, burned in their lust for one another. Men with men committing what is shameful and receiving in themselves the penalty of their error which was due. People say today, the Bible never condemns homosexuality. What? What am I reading here? Verse 28. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a debased mind to do those things which are not fitting, being filled with all unrighteousness, sexual immorality, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, evil-mindedness. Feels like we're watching the news. They are whisperers, backbiters, haters of God, violent, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents, undiscerning, untrustworthy, unloving, unforgiving, unmerciful, who knowing the righteous judgment of God that those who practice such things are deserving of death, not only do the same, but also approve of those who practice them. Wow. That's heavy, hard-hitting stuff. Right there. And, you know, when we talk about homosexuality and all of that, we're talking about the sin of homosexuality. We're not talking about homosexuals who God loves. God loves homosexuals and wants them to repent and turn back to him, you see. But the sin, he, it's an abomination to God. It's a world gone mad. The world at the time of Noah was not only wicked and perverted, but that also leads to unrestrained violence. Verse 40. Then two men will be in the field. One will be taken, the other left. Two women will be grinding at the mill. One will be taken and the other left. Now some see this as a rapture passage. 
But in the context of what Jesus is talking about here, I believe it's talking about the final judgment of the tribulation. The verb taken implies to take someone to be with you, and therefore I believe it's pointing to the salvation of a person during the tribulation rather than being taken away in judgment. But I think all of that misses the point completely. Jesus' point here is that he's trying to make is that it's going to take them by surprise. That's his point. It's going to take... They didn't know they were marrying, they were eating, they were drinking until the flood came and washed them all away. Surprise, you see. And so it's the element of surprise. And... Uh, so uh, people are not going to be expecting it because many are not going to be following God. Paul the Apostle said the same thing in 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 1. But concerning the times and the seasons, brethren, you have no need that I should write you. For you yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so comes as a thief in the night. For when they say peace and safety, then sudden destruction comes upon them as labor pains upon a pregnant woman, and they shall not escape. So notice how they'll be taken by surprise. Same kind of language by Paul the Apostle. Now back before the flood, Genesis tells us that the world was full of unrestrained violence. So if we go back there again, Genesis 6 verse 13, and God said to Noah, the end of all flesh has come before me. For the earth is filled with violence through them, and behold, I will destroy them with the earth. So it was unrestrained wickedness and unrestrained perversion, which leads to unrestrained violence. Anytime there's an in increase in demonic activity, folks, there's going to be an increase in violence. Do you know that? And it seems that there was a complete lack of repentance at that time as well, as there is today. Listen to some of the headlines that I picked up on Thursday, because that's when I was working on this particular point. So I just randomly went online and looked for the headline news, and CBS News popped up, and I just clicked on that, and I looked at the news headlines on CBS. Totally random. These were the, head the main headlines. Boy in stolen car killed by owner who tracked down vehicle with app. Alec Baldwin faces new lawsuit over rust shooting. Minnesota rep Angie Craig assaulted at D.C. apartment building. Woman gets six years in prison for using COVID relief funds for plastic surgery. New Jersey councilman fatally shot by former colleague. Girl missing over a year found hiding in closet of a Michigan home. Murder subject who cut off ankle, break, uh, ankle monitor is on the run in New Mexico. Minnesota mom convicted of killing her six-year-old son. And former University of Connecticut student pleads guilty to deadly samurai sword attack. These were just the main headlines that I just went right down one after the other and just copy them and, and put them into, into the sermon here. And that's just the, the main headlines of one day. I mean, this world is going mad. And on top of that, on a larger scale, North Korea is threatening the U.S. again, and, and threatening their neighbors as well. China's flying spy balloons over us, also threatening us. Russia's causing all pro kinds of problems with their neighbors and threatening us as well. I mean, it's all enough to make your head spin. There's so much going on right now. And the unrestrained violence of today is over the top. You can't even go to the mall anymore without looking over your shoulder. Has the world gone mad? Yes. The answer is yes, because it's madness to reject the God who made us. See, that's madness. That's insanity. That's crazy. And no matter what's done 
at the governmental levels, oh, we need reform, we just need reform, we need to do this, we need to do that. No matter what's done at the governmental levels, they just can't seem to get hold of the unrestrained violence that's plaguing this world right now. There were a total of 1,313,105 violent crimes in the U.S. in 2020. Over 1 million violent crimes. On average, violent crime has climbed by 12% in U.S. cities, while property crime has declined by 33% since 2010. Robbery rates fell in the, a in the average U.S. city by 23%, while murder, rape, and aggravated assault all climbed by 25% or more. See, the violent crimes are going up. Motor vehicle theft was the only type of property crime to rise in the average city over the past decade, increasing by 48%. Which is interesting, don't you think? With all the modern technology of the alarms and everything else that are in cars, it's increased by 48%. <laughs> Out of America's largest metropolises, Detroit led the nation in both murder and rape in 2020. Seattle had the most reported burglaries, and Memphis, uh, Memphis Tennessee had the most larceny theft incidents. Out of all uh, cities with smaller populations, two Louisiana cities had the highest murder rates, Baton Rouge and Shreveport, two simil similarly, <laughs> similarly <laughs> sized California cities, Richmond and Hayward, topped the list for motor vehicle theft. And the murder rate in small cities climbed by more than 80% on average between 2010 and 2020. And this trend is gonna just continue right into the tribulation period. So verse 42, Jesus says, Watch, therefore, for you do not know what hour your Lord is coming. But know this, that if the master of the house had known what hour the thief would come, he would have watched and not allowed his house to be broken into. If you knew a thief was going to break into your house tonight at midnight, would you do anything about it? Would you take precautions about it? Well, that's what Jesus is saying here. We as Christians, we know what's coming upon this earth. Take precautions. Watch. Be ready. We know what's going to happen. The people of this world don't, and they're going to be swept away in the flood, so to speak. Be ready. Be watching. Paul says the same thing in that passage of 1 Thessalonians that we just looked at. It goes on, and it says this. But you, brethren, you, brothers and sisters in Christ, are not in darkness so that this day should overtake you as a thief. You are all sons of light and sons of the day. We are not of the night nor of darkness. Therefore, let us not sleep as others do, but let us watch and be sober. For those who sleep, sleep at night. And those who get drunk are drunk at night. But let us who are of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love, and as a helmet the hope of salvation. For God did not appoint us to wrath but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, that whether we wake or sleep, we should live together with him. Therefore, comfort each other and edify one another, just as you also are doing. So Paul says we shouldn't live in darkness. We shouldn't live in fear concerning the coming judgment. We are sons and daughters of the day. And God did not appoint us to wrath. Now some people say that the wrath he's talking about there is eternal wrath, eternal punishment of hell. That's not the context. He's talking about the end times. He's talking about the day of the Lord, the judgment of the tribulation period. But you, brethren, are not in darkness so that this day should overtake you as a thief. 
So he's talking about that judgment day when Jesus comes again. We are not appointed to that wrath because we have obtained salvation through Jesus Christ. Verse 44. Therefore, you also be ready, for the Son of Man is coming at an hour you do, do not expect. Maranatha. I'll close with this. Warren Wiersbe. He says, while the interpretation of this section relates to Israel during the tribulation, we may apply the word to our own hearts. We do not know when our Lord will return for his church. Therefore, we must be alert, watchful, and faithful. How grateful we ought to be that God has not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation when Jesus Christ appears. He has saved us from the wrath to come. As the people of God, we will certainly go through tribulation, but not the tribulation. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word today. Firm warnings, strong warnings, Lord. As it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be when you come again. And Lord, we're seeing those things. We're seeing the beginning of birth pains. And we're seeing these things increase in intensity and frequency. And surely, Lord, you're coming again soon. And we want to be ready. We want to be watching. We want to be alert. And we want to occupy till you come with the things of God. Letting people know about Jesus. Offering them the only hope that's available. And that's Jesus Christ. Thank you, Lord, for your word today. As hard as it is, Lord, it's necessary that we hear it. And necessary that we read your words. And as we leave this place, Lord, bless us. Bless each person here. May each person go with your blessing upon them. as they face this world that's gone mad. And we thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name, amen. amen. We bow our hearts we bend our knees oh spirit come make us humble we turn our eyes from evil things oh lord we cast down our idols give us clean hands Give us pure hearts, let us not lift our souls to another, give us clean hands, give us pure hearts, let us not lift our souls to bow our hearts, we bend our knees, oh Spirit come make us humble, we turn our eyes from evil things, oh Lord we cast down our idols, give us clean Give us pure hearts, let us not lift our souls to another, give us clean hands, give us pure hearts, let us not lift our souls to generation that seeks, seeks 